Hello and welcome everybody to this month's Practice Clinic live to you on Facebook here. Um, I'm Graham Fitch, I'm the author of Practicing the Piano blog and co-founder of the Online Academy. And we've got here a bunch of questions sent in by uh, subscribers to the Online Academy to do with practicing and sometimes that spills over into technique and sometimes that's uh, to do with style as well and I'm, my job here is to uh, address these questions and, and see if I can be helpful in response. So do let me know, I see Viv is watching, Janet is watching, um, do please let me know where you're watching from and if you like to press all those nice buttons that Facebook has uh, feel free to do so. You can press heart buttons, you can press wow buttons, there's like buttons, there's all sorts of other stuff. Don't press the one with the red face, please. Um, I don't like those ones. Okay, uh, of course that's inviting somebody to do it, isn't it? Thank you. Right, let me just get started straight away with a question from Puck, who asks about Bergmuller's Pastoral, which is the um, number three from the beautiful set of Etudes Opus 100, the 25 Etudes Opus 100, which despite their age have never got jaded, they've never got stale. These are just beautiful pieces for the elementary to intermediate pianist. And Puck is asking about the Pastoral Bar 5. When can double grace notes be played? Please break down the timing of the two sixteenth notes. The first beat is a dotted quarter note, in other words, three eighth notes still in play. There is no room to squeeze the two sixteenth note grace notes before beat two. The difficulty of playing them is com compounded by the beginning of the grace note. It's the same note, A. Oh, so this is the this is the piece that Puck is talking about. Um... And that's the bar. That's the bar, bar five. So it's a very quick answer um, to this which is they're before the beat. They have to be before the beat. Now, um, an ornament either takes note values from the note before the beat or the note on the beat, depending on its style period. Usually in the Baroque period, almost always in the Baroque period, a, a slide like this would be on the beat. So if this were Baroque, let me do it slowly for you. I would put that on the beat. But because it's not Baroque and it doesn't sound good like that, we're going to put it before the beat. So the, t the time of the two sixteenths is taken out of the dotted quarter. So if you wanted to count it out, one and two and three and, I would put it on the and of, of three. One and two and three and one. You see how that works? Now, you, you, you're worried, I think, by, by the fact that you have to release the A, the, the dotted uh, quarter. Yeah, you do have to release the A, that's fine. There's no legato marking between the A and... No, there is the here. There there is. I'm not over a couple of bars. Here not. Does that mean we'd want to take a gap before each one of those dotted quarters if, if it doesn't have a connection to the next note? Probably not, but think about where the music might want to breathe. Now, if you didn't like the gap, um, hello Tanya, nice to see you. And I've seen we've got lo loads of people from all over the place, from, from uh, Indonesia as well. Uh, Frankie is watching from Indonesia. If you didn't like that gap, just use a little bit of pedal. Change there. It's just a little decoration there. I hope that answers that one for you, Pook. The next question comes from Susan, who is working on Beethoven Opus 49, number two, both movements. Um, and I'm hoping for advice on appropriate motions. Right, so this is a technical question. Um, starting in measure six, first movement, uh, let's look at that one. And then from the beginning of the second movement, I'm trying to use a slight rotating movement for the left forearm. Are there further options to work on? Okay, well, Susan, this, this is the, for, for the benefit of those that might not know where we're, what we're talking about, this sonata. <laughs> If 
you can see what I'm doing here. This is what Susan's asking about the rotary movements between in the within the hand there, so coming from the forearm. It's my instinct to use rotations there um, because it makes it feel much freer and much easier. And you know the op the other options are just to use finger movements, very close to the keys and very light. Nothing wrong with doing that. What's wrong with that? A little bit of emphasis on the lower note uh, because that forms a bass line, doesn't it, with what's going on upstairs. That's the voice leading there. Hello, Lynn from North Wales. Yes, this is Opus 49 number two. Um, somebody just asked what, what Beethoven Opus 49 number two. So what we've got there is in the left hand is the lower note is more important than the upper note. So I would want to use my rotations not only to keep me very free, but just, just to be able to control the sound as well. And just to remind you some of the rules about rotations in, in case you're wondering what's going on there. The rotation just comes from the the forearm, this, this movement here is one of the most natural movements the arm can make. Um, and to stop it happening, which has been a part of our pianistic past, is, is silly because it's, it's absolutely integral. I'm reminded of Clementi's uh, instructions that to put a penny on the back of the hand. Can you imagine that? And if the penny should fall off, then you're doing something wrong. Um, it may have worked for the pianos of the time. I, I doubt it that this, you know, this, is, this is a far better way of moving. It's much more ergonomic, much more, um, can, much freer in the body. So what I'm doing when I make my rotations, you can see that I'm not, I'm not allowing my elbow to drop. This is the mistake people make with rotary movements. They, they destabilize here. Hello, Veronique from Switzerland. Um, and they, 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 they will break from here. So when we're rotating, it's much easier uh, to, to manage the movement if we do not let the elbow dip up and down and we don't break uh, in the wrist. So if you wanted to practice this, let me do it an octave lower because I'm worried that some of you might not be able to see um, as clearly in this register. So I'm going to do it an octave lower. You see how the, the movement works. And there I needed a black note because black notes are a little higher up and further away. I needed to make a movement inside to the back of the keyboard. Otherwise I risk sort of flattening out my forefinger and stretching for it. So in, back out. Yeah, I hope that gives you the answer to that one. And then also, what was the other one? I'm um, looking at the other part. First movement and from the beginning of the second movement. Yeah, if we look at the beginning of the second movement, exactly the same idea. legato here it's not exactly staccato but it's 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 not really too legato for practice you'll, you'll notice you've got two voices not two voices two notes single note if you wanted to sense the how that movement would feel very stable just practice the upper one first and do the lower one. And again, you'll notice I'm using uh, the range of my of the length of the keyboard. I'm not trying to do that all on one plane um, because we've got different length fingers and we've got different shaped uh, black white notes on the keyboard. So we have to uh, adjust always to that. Now there are a few other questions here. Let me just go through them if I can. Um, uh, well, Susan asked, are there further options to work on? Well, I, ju I just think that's the most natural way of moving at the piano, so I, I would tend to use my rotations there. Other ones, uh, little bounces close to the key. But I still find myself wanting to open this up. Okay, so measure 15 first movement. Um, we've got a similar idea. Yes, okay, here's where we've got the, the little bridge passage to the second subject. A left hand again doing 
too many. I'm doing not enough rubber. <laughs> Exactly the same idea of rotating. If you're struggling to sense that, just play five to one. You can even put that together with the other hand. And then you can add. Where was the other one? Um, okay, let me just look. Second movement, measure 28. Let's see what that's all about. Um, 28. Yes, exactly the same sort of idea. It's an Alberti bass. There I need to go in and up. Because I've got to put my thumb here onto a black key. So I need to have moved for, to accommodate that. Same thing. Now there's one other question that Susan has about the sixths in this movement. Um, which come in bar 68. She asks here, um, there are some six in the right hand. I've been fingering those as upper notes, five, four, sorry, four, five, four, three, trying for legato and all ones for the lower note. Yeah, I think all ones is certainly good. In general, beyond this piece, I have difficulty with sequences of sixths, which involve two, five, one, four. Well, yeah, I'm not surprised. Two, five, one, four puts a, quite a stretch in the hand. So if you were to do, some six with that fingering and they need to be legato you won't be able to connect legato you'd have to make a break in the upper voice lift the five pivot over the thumb okay but in this instance i wouldn't play too legato i'm noticing that beethoven has put slurs also i'm using a good edition here i've got the urtext edition in front of me um, Beethoven's been very specific about where he wants his legatos. I'm just randomly looking. Mark legato here. There are quite clear legato marks, but here, none. So do you see what I'm suggesting there? Where Beethoven has not marked legato. Question, are these supposed to be legato? I certainly wouldn't want to connect these. Uh, Kate, hello. Can you hear a bassoon there? You know, tongue each one. There would be a, a, a silence in between each one, an articulation in between each one. Here too, lift. Now that doesn't mean we can't use a little splash of pedal if we want to on the, uh, where is it, where am I, here, pedal, 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 a little touch, a little accent from the pedal, adding a little bit of resonance. So I would certainly say it's fine to do four, one, five, one, four, one. This fingering here has five, two, which is quite nice actually, and then come back up again for the but I'm not aiming to connect them. So I hope that uh, solves that uh, issue. Great, let's move on. Um, the next question is from Vidya, who, actually I've got my, my out of order here. It's this next. Vidya asks, in Chopin's Nocturne, Opus 55, number two, Please provide some advice on measures 52 to 54, especially playing the trills and melody notes on the right hand smoothly. Any other learning suggestions in the piece would be welcome too. Okay, this is an absolutely stunning nocturne. It's one of those pieces that, um, hello Charles, nice to see you. It's one of those pieces that um, gives you goosebumps. You know, I'm sure music does that to all of us. Um, it doesn't matter how many times you hear certain pieces, you know that there's gonna be that moment that comes up where you've got the goosebumps. And, and I think this piece is a sort of a goose bumpy piece all the way through. So the, the bit that Vidya is asking about is, is where, well, let me play it. I'm going to just show you in slow motion because I think the first thing to say about it is the trill has to be measured out. I wouldn't go for a free for all trill. I would do it four notes in the, in the right hand for the price of one in the left. <laughs> my 
my top to that. Let me show you from the bar before. I'm, I'm going to do it slowly for a little while, just so people can hear the four notes. Do you hear what I'm doing there? So the underneath is, is very even, it's very controlled, and it's super soft. So how does it work when we add the melody note on the top? We've got to be careful when we, when we hold on to notes on the top. Um, ask ourselves, do we need to hold on to that note on the top? Or can we, hold, can we let that be held in the pedal? So if I go back to bar 55, let me just go straight into bar 55, because here it, it, we do not need to hold on to our upper notes for the full length. <laughs> be able to see um, what I might do uh, I, I think you can see there what I'm doing so my underneath 2-1 is playing the trill in groups of four now what I can do there and this is something that comes to us from Hans von Bulow who suggested that when we've got trills like that we can leave out the note let me show you so so I start the trill on the upper note. I think that's important. You've got to make a decision. Do you start the trill on the upper note, in this instance the E-flat? Or do you do it on the main note? Now you'll find that some players do it one way, some players do it another way, because there's no absolute answer to this. Um, Chopin was a very classical uh, composer from in his stance on ornamentation, and we often find that the ornaments go on the beat and they start on the upper note. But not always. So I, I have chosen here to play my trill from the upper note. Now here I have to play my A flat and my E flat together, or do I? Do you hear what I'm doing now? I'm, when I play my A flat, I'm actually not playing the note that should go with it, which would be the E flat. I'm just leaving that note out. Now I'd be surprised if you could hear it. And anybody who's played Opus 109 of Beethoven would, um, okay, uh, may maybe is asking advice for Super Soft. I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, Opus, 101, Opus 109 Beethoven, where we have those trills. It's up here, but you won't see it if I do it up there. What I'm doing is playing the upper note, then coming back to join my trill, upper note by itself. There's no way you can play the trill note and the upper note at the same time. So you could avail yourself of that principle here. So let me do that in super slow motion again. I wonder if you can hear what I'm doing. It's, it's, it's a, when I say it's a cheat, it's not a cheat. It's sleight of hand. It's the sort of thing that magicians do all the time. They produce some amazing trick and we know it's not real. And we don't know how they do it. But it's the same with piano playing. Sometimes we have to, to know that we can do something there that actually makes it much easier to play without, we don't get tight, um, and nobody's going to hear it. So, you know, ask yourself, what does the audience need to hear? And in this instance, I would be very, very uh, keen to explore that idea. So let me show you further in bar 55, the same, uh, I'm gonna take that principle further, so. Uh, let me play from the beginning of the bar, even though there's a tight note there. Two, three. There I need to play because the, the, the note changes. It's a D natural now. But in no other place in that bar did I play my melody note with the, the trill note that would go with it. I just simply omit that note of the trill at that point. And, and, and it sounds wonderful. And the, also, the other thing that I'm doing, I'm showing you naked, the, the, the thing naked, it's got no pedal either. But uh, so. Notice how I'm letting go of those melody notes because the pedal is down. And that sounds great, doesn't it? Uh,
Now, how somebody asked, maybe asked earlier about how to keep that note, uh, that, how to keep the trill soft. Well, we've got to remember with soft playing, um, what makes a note loud or soft is the speed of, of key descent. It's, it's how fast you put the key down or how slowly you put the key down. But there's another thing involved in soft playing, which is to be inside the key before you play. So um, what I'm doing when I play my trill here, I'm not let allowing my second finger to, or my thumb to come all the way up again. So it's not this. I'm inside my key and I'm working from the sounding point, the escapement. So if you wanted to experience that, what you could do would be to put the two notes of the troll down together. I'm going to just bring it down an octave so you can see a bit clearer. And I'm going to repeat my E flat without coming all the way to the top and then the D flat without coming all the way to the top. And then, see that keeps me really soft. And then I can ring my upper note. so that that comes out firmly and clearly and the trill is just like a, a, a little flutter that goes on underneath. I think Vidya asked about any other learning suggestions in the piece would be welcome too. Well, one thing I do really find with this music, this particular piece, is the, the multi-layered right hand. Um, I happen to have in front of me the Alfred Cortot edition, but I'm, in case you're wondering, which edition I've got here. The, the thing with the Alfred Cortot edition is it's got some interesting exercises for practice, some of which are fantastic and others, others are, are not at all good because they tend to um, involve stretching out the hand, which was a kind of a, a phenomenon in that time when, when Cortot was, was teaching. They, they kind of believed in doing lots of exercises to, for stretching, which we don't do really nowadays so much. I don't like the stretching exercises. And so some of these exercises I would discount immediately and others, if you look around and use your judgment, you can find some fantastic practice suggestions. Um, I'll, I can show you the, what the book looks like. It looks like this and you can get it. This one happens to have the ballads and the nocturnes together. And some of the suggestions for the, for the ballads are, are just e excellent. And if you practice like that, you'll learn it in no time. Um, so what we've got here are two lines in the right hand, you know. Which we've got to layer. I would suggest practicing the right hand part using just using two hands. Uh, to make it easy to create the sound. So what we do is we use two hands for that and then we copy the sounds that we've just created with one hand. The other thing to notice about this piece is really the, the long arches created by the really long phrases. Um, so don't chop the music up into small phrases. It's tempting to do that. It's actually quite easy to chop it up into small phrases. But if you look at how long the phrase marks last you'll see um, yeah so continue continue and the left hand arches you'll notice that the left hand phrasing does not always match the right hand phrasing so if the right hand's got one long phrase underneath it the left hand might have smaller kind of vaulted arches and you'd need to consider the shaping of those how you want to shape them a little bit of crescendo to the middle or does it diminuendo as you go through the arch and explore the, the, the shaping of that, um, melodic shaping I mean. Gorgeous piece, if you don't know it, uh, make friends with it, it's, it's fantastic. The next question comes from Barbara who, she says, my question concerns a few bars in the grade 7 Trinity, that's 2018 to 20 and the new 2021 to 23 uh, lists and it's the Fiesta by Joachim Turina, um, a piece that starts like this. Really exciting piece. It's all uh, paints a picture of sunny time in, in, in Spain um, and like a gala type of thing. It feels so much a thing of the past, doesn't it, if you think, think about it now. But maybe we'll get those coming back sometime soon. 
Um, a few bars are proving a stumbling block for her, my student that is, and for me too. Bars 43 to 46, the rising arpeggio at the end of bar 43, leading to that chord at the top. Um, it's still a bit messy. Perhaps there's a problem with a fingering, although I've tried a few options. I would be so grateful if Graham could let us know the best way to practice these few bars, as I do feel the tempo should be maintained. And she should, she's now playing it fast at around uh, crotchet equals 120. That's quarter note equals 120. Okay, so the thing about, you know, the, the, this, this spot in the piece, it's a climactic moment. Um, it's marked fortissimo. Let me just see if I can do it. Now the thing is, I changed my fingering to, to, to show uh, different examples, so I'm hoping I'll be able to get a fingering that works now. Yeah, a bit messy. You know what it's like when you're experimenting with fingerings, but just before the, the clinic started, I thought, let's see if I can find another fingering for that. And I did find another one, and now I've, I've forgotten my original. So what I, what I actually would do is this. One, two, five, one, two, five. Five, one, two, and then jump. But we need to unpack it a little bit and just see what's going on there. So in terms of pedaling, my instinct would be to change pedal there, probably. Although, if you wanted to really build the sound, you might consider holding that pedal longer. I don't think so, personally. Yeah. Change there. However, here... Those two bars, bar 45, 46, I think work very nicely in one long pedal. It's one harmony, isn't it? So the way I would, would organise this, one, two, five, and as I play one, two, five, my thumb is coming in to join my hand, and then I'm rotating into my thumb. Do you see how that works? Let me do a whole bunch of those. And it's possible to do that very fast and very accurately and legato uh, with the rotary movement. It's a very fast rotation. If I show you slow-mo, uh, don't do it slowly, but it looks like this. If it were to be played back in slow motion, you'd see me, my thumb goes over. You've heard of thumb under and you've heard of thumb over. That's a th thumb over. And it's a very free, elastic movement. Very free. I'm not engaging any of these, I'm not holding onto any of these muscles up here. And it's done by my forearm. I didn't change my pedal, did I? Now, the, the, the crucial thing is when you get to the F sharp, the last note in bar 44, you've got to propel yourself off that note. Because if a lot of people worry about landings, where they've got to land on uh, the note that, or the chord that they've got to land on, but they don't think about the note before the jump which is the jump, if you think about it, it's integral to the success. It's, it's how you get off the F sharp that determines how you land. Now what I did there is I, I pinged myself off the key. Uh, Junho, nice to see you. Up, down. So it's a free release and it feels lovely. Anybody who's ever played the Tchaikovsky Concerto knows how lovely that beginning feels because all I do is kick, my, kick off against the keyboard. It's the same sense, up. Now, if I've come up freely, I can land freely on those three notes. So the first thing I would practice would be just to take the F sharp and to land, again, I'm worried that you might not see, let me do it an octave lower. So I jump off my F sharp and I land behind the three fingers. Do you notice how square my arm is, my forearm is lined up behind that, that chord? Now, if you want, you could practice landing into, let's say, the pinky first, and then let the other two fingers touch in afterwards. Now, let me go to the to the C sharp, and let the other fingers touch in afterwards. That's the lower finger. Now, let me do combinations: the outer fingers and then the inner fingers. The lowest two followed by the upper. You get the idea. So we. We secure that movement, and then when I come to it, I can land in it with reliably. But there's another thing that stops that from being 100% um, comfortable, which is this big chord in the left hand. So if we want to be really super comfortable with that, 
what we would have to do would be to organize the first two notes to come before the beat. So we're going to do it really slowly and change pedal on those two bass notes, the, the bare fifth. Now I think it would be a shame to change the pedal, as I said earlier, just to keep that whole resonance going there. So did you get that? Let me go back and do that in slow motion again. Change the pedal here. Jump, change. Now before I um, move away from this, the fingering that I had organized before that, that kind of confused me um, when I first tried it, but it, it it's this. So I was thinking, what would, ha what would it happen if I shifted my thumb over to the C sharp and played my upper C sharp with a pinky and then moved to the thumb on the F sharp? That might be worth considering, Barbara. So let me go over that again. One, two, five. One, two, four, five. And then one, three, one, uh, actually this, five, three, two. Then you could use a thumb on the A and then let the left hand come over and take the first E. And the same deal here, left, right. It's, it's just a redistribution. So the third quaver, the third eighth note in bar 45 might be taken by the left hand. Now the trouble with this is if you've already got this to a, an, uh, no, Lawrence, uh, okay, uh, I don't see what what, uh, what that's, that says. Okay, I'll have to look at that comment afterwards. I just see the word no. Um, now, redistributions like that are perfectly legal and they're perfectly kosher. It's, if the problem is that if you've already learned another fingering, um, would you then want to relearn as drastically as that? I would suggest not. I would say if you've already learned a fingering in, rather see if you can, see if you can, use that fingering rather than change it uh, hectically at the last moment. If you've got some weeks to go for the exam, fine, maybe it's worth doing. But I'm, I'm, as I get older, I'm realizing that fingering is so ingrained. That once you've ingrained it, it's kind of difficult to shift it. So yeah, that, that is a tricky spot in the piece, but um, it's not the only tricky spot, but we don't have time to go through all the other parts of that piece. <laughs> and coming to the to the next question, Bill. He's working on the Brahms arrangement for the left hand alone of the D minor Chaconne of Bach. And I'd appreciate some suggestions on how to practice the long arpeggio suggestion, uh, sorry, long arpeggio section. Uh, there are many challenges there. For example, the first arpeggios, and he, he goes on to list a few things. Now I happen to have here on my iPad, um, the. The bar number, the first point that Bill raises is bar 89. These two measures and the first two on the next page involve arpeggios with a leap to an octave and a fifth, and I'm finding it difficult to get them convincingly smooth at tempo. Yes, it's very, it's a very awkward moment in the piece. Um, and I, I happen to just, I was curious to see how other pianists did this. And there was a live performance on YouTube, where the, where the very great pianist missed it. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's one of those challenges. What, what Bill's talking about. Um, that spot, bar uh, 89. Now, you see, I, I had a, a thought there. If you make a little exercise for yourself that starts putting the thumb on a comfortable, convenient note, You'll feel there, I'm using my fourth finger on the F. You will feel that the, the motion is, is fairly comfortable and involves circularity. So it's circling, pivoting. Then what you can do from that, so I'm now playing a D. And what I'm doing is progressively moving my upper note. So. to the A, it is beyond the stretch. We can't stretch it, but however, it, it's too fast to bring the thumb all the way back in. So there is an element of keeping the thumb 
out. But I'm sensing there that I want to straddle those two notes with a high wrist. But I've also got to be very stable behind those, that pair of fingers. So I would suggest for practice, practice landing on the A. And just so that you can get used to that sense of propulsion, make a little exercise for yourself, which jumps you onto the thumb in other spots on the keyboard where you're not needing to go further than you need to go. And then you've got to get down from there back to the fourth finger. So again, some little exercises like that, which encourage you to jump. Uh, Bill, oh, he's here. Yes, I tried that, it helps. Okay, good. Um, also putting the top note an octave higher. Yeah, that's, um, then it seems easier when you go back to the original. Yes, absolutely. Um, but the when you get to the next bar here, there's a, see that one is easier, the G, C sharp, D, because you can connect here. Now I'm not trying to join my C sharp to my D, but I am joining it in the arm. So I'm not joining by finger, but I'm joining in the arm. Do you see there's a, a motion there that keeps that going? Um, the easiest one, that's not the easiest one, but that's not the hardest one either. This one is the easiest one, because that is, is under the hand, uh, uh, within reach. Um, so explore the idea of just having a higher wrist. Um, I also, when I was looking at this, this is not a piece that's in my repertoire, when, when I first looked at it, I was exploring the idea of an imaginary pivot around the B area with my second finger. So in other words, I'm finding a midpoint. It might be the C for your hand. Do you see what I'm doing there? So I'm using that second finger either on the B or the C or maybe in the crack between. No, you, you better not be in a crack. It doesn't like it. And then when you remove, yes, see, that feels more stable because the, this, the second finger is the axis for the, for the movement even though the second finger is not playing anything. Give that a shot, see if that helps you. Uh, the next question Bill had with this was uh, bar 97. So, uh, okay, let me see if I can find bar 40. Yes, it's where the sends up head, where we have this pattern. just as I was exploring this, I discovered that the fingering um, possibility here, five, three, five, two, I'm not sure if you change finger there, Bill, so five, two, one, five, three, yeah, and then, see how that works. Now the movement again here would be very free if you rotated it. I want to use a little pedal and I'm sure I wouldn't be the first um, I, sh I wouldn't be the first one to to feel like a little bit of pedal there so I think again here to use the pivots would be your best it's the middle finger isn't it and then here C sharp the D the D stays and that goes for your last uh, spot which was the um let's see which is let me just see bar 112 the last system um at the bottom of the page uh, a four measure variation with awkward adduction abduction at the wrist seemingly required to play the arpeggios beginning triplets uh, with the pinky on the black keys well yes you want to make sure that when you start these groups <laughs> not stretched out so the idea there would be to have the hand closed up and then move now I don't like one two one two there that really puts a nasty stretch and I've got a big hand so I was exploring going to a four maybe or, or possibly a three 
and then just just hopping down. Whoa, sorry. I told you this wasn't in my repertoire. But do you see how I'm again pivoting around my middle finger? Whichever finger that is, there's a jump. There's, a, there, there's another spot where I would come up to a four or maybe even a five. Jump. So I'm moving this way. Um, and again, I feel like my wrist needs to be fairly high to accommodate all of those movements. In other words, the lower the wrist, the harder those movements are going to be. Yes, Bill says he fingers, his, fingers it that way. But you know, you've got to remember with these pieces that they're not um, supposed to be easy. They do, they are challenging. This is a very challenging piece for the, for the left hand alone. Um, full of, of, of uncomfortable, what, what feel like stretches and what, which actually are stretches. But do you notice that I'm not keeping my hands stretched out in all of those places? I'm coming back to a cl as closed pos I'm starting off from a closed position and I'm coming back to a closed position and then either a jump or a pivot where I can. See there, I pivot. There, I pivot. And just one final thing before I sign off. The... The string, if you listen to string recordings of this, it, there's an element of freedom in these ta -la -la -pa 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 patterns that they're not metronomic, they're not in time from that strict sense. There, there's freedom there as, as the bow has to cross the from one string to another and it's built into the style of this piece. So I think you could explore just seeing what it felt like to be flexible with the, you know, and maybe spreading, taking a little time at the beginning of each harmony so you've got um, time for it to register. Well, there were some very good questions there this week, some interesting repertoire that came out from, the, uh, from my subscribers. So do keep the questions coming in, and there's a way of doing that. We have a protocol for that, which you will find in, in the link below. I'm sure um, Ryan will be adding a link to that effect. So I see that there's all sorts of uh, conversation going on, which I'm not party to. So I'll have to look at that when I leave now and see what people have been saying about the World Temple Clavier and Bach. But anyway, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attendance and for your patience and, and for your comments, which I will get to. And we will have another practice clinic very soon. And uh, this is a monthly event. So if you would like to ask me questions, feel free to do so uh, via the official channel. Thank you so much for joining us. See you soon. Bye-bye.